Welcome back. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about the very last of our causal inference methods that we're going to go over. Right? We've talked about a number of things. We've talked about controlling for variables, and we've talked about using fixed effects as a particular example of controlling for variables. We've talked about matching on variables. We talked about using difference in difference, when you have a policy you observe both before and after. We talked about regression discontinuity, when you have a policy that is assigned based on just coming over a cutoff. Finally, we're going to be talking about instrumental variables, which is an example of a natural experiment where you're basically looking for a variable that sort of mimics an experiment for you. That's your instrumental variable. And the idea here is that we're looking for some variable that affects your treatment and has no other effect on your outcome except through your treatment. That all the back doors between the instrumental variable and the outcome variable are closed, and you're going to be very, very certain that this is actually true. And when this happens, you basically have an experiment. You can imagine how this might work. Well, Matt, let's, let's take a very basic, let's talk about an actual experiment, a randomized experiment where you randomly assign people to either go to the doctor's office or you don't, and then you observe whether or not they're sick afterwards. In this case, you can sort of imagine that the random assignment itself fits exactly what we needed to do here. The only way that randomly assigning somebody to go to the doctor's office would affect their health is if it actually made them go to the doctor's office, right? So there's no back door. All of the effect of randomizing somebody to go to the doctor's office goes through them actually going to the doctor's office. So we know that it affects whether you go to the doctor's office, it has randomly assigned your treatment, and there's no other way it could affect it. Now, when this happens, what we can do is sort of like the opposite of controlling for a variable. When we control for a variable, we want to get rid of whatever that variable explains because that part of the variation in x and y, that part of the relationship between x and y is invalid. It's only there because of the back door. In the case of the randomization, we want to focus just on the variation that's explained by our instrumental variable. So in the case of an experiment, if we randomly assign people to go to the doctor or not, we would compare just the people that we randomly assigned versus just the people that we didn't. We would basically take what we can explain with our instrumental variable, take what we can explain with our random assignment, and only use that. So just like with controlling for a variable, we're going to explain our x and our y using our instrumental variable. But instead of tossing out what we explain, we're going to keep what we explain and toss out all the residual. That's how instrumental variables work. Now, the cool thing about instrumental variables is that they have a very recognizable causal diagram. And let's take a look at it here. So when we have a instrumental variable, it tends to follow a pattern like this. We have some sort of x that we're interested in the effect on y. We have some sort of back door that keeps us from just being able to look at the relationship. Maybe we can't measure w and control for it. Maybe there's just so many different w's that we can't possibly control for them all. But we have some r. And the important thing is that r, which here stands for randomization, affects our x. It affects whether or not we get the treatment, or it affects whatever our treatment variable is, our exposure variable. But it does not affect y except through x. There's no path from r to y that does not go through x. That's what makes this an effective instrumental variable. Let's talk about an example of this. A common way that instrumental variables is applied is when we are actually running an, ex running an experiment, but it doesn't work properly. Let's say, for example, that we have a randomized experiment. We're randomizing people to go to the doctor's office, but they don't always do what we say. So some of them are going to actually do the randomization that we say. We say, you don't go to the doctor's office, you go to the doctor's office. Some of the people we say not to, they're going to go anyway. Some of the people we say to go, they're not going to go. Okay? Now, we still have some random randomization. You can imagine that the, that causal diagram that we're interested in applies here. Our randomization still is going to affect whether you go to the doctor's office. Maybe it's not perfect, but it will clearly increase the probability that you go to the doctor's office. And there's no way to get from your randomization to the outcome except through the doctor's office. There's no way that me telling you to go to the doctor's office is going to affect your health except for it affecting whether or not you go. So in this case, we're going to use instrumental variables. We're going to focus just on what we can explain with the instrumental variable. So you can see how this works graphically. We're going to start with some raw data with different values of z. We're going to see what is explained by z. We're going to take the average of x within z and then just keep that. We're going to get rid of all the other variation in both x and y. Then we're going to look at the slope relating the two points that we end up with. And that slope is going to be our causal effect of x on y. Let's actually work this out using the imperfect assignment that we talked about before. 
So let's work this out in R using that imperfect experiment assignment that we talked about before. So I'm going to load in the tidyverse and I'm going to create some data. So here's what the data is. I'm going to set R, whether I randomly assign you to get to the treatment, as uh, either 0 or 1. First of all, I'm going to say it works perfectly. So I'm going to just set x equal to R. If I told you to go, you go. If I told you not to go, you don't. But then I'm going to randomly switch some of them. So 20% of people uh, I'm going to set to the opposite thing. So if I told you to go, 20% of them are not going to go. If I told them not to go, 20% of them are going to go. And then I'm going to create y, which is a positive function of x. So x has a positive effect on y. If I run this, and then I just look at the difference in average between people who went to the doctor's office or not, I get a difference of about 3. Right Now the true effect was 5. And I ran a random experiment, and yet I only got 3. How is this possible? So basically, I'm expecting that... 0% of people went to the doctor if I told them not to, and 100% of the people did if I... So all the difference there, I'm expecting, that's a, that's a change from 0% to 100%, when in fact it's not. It's a change from 20% to 80%. So I'm overestimating how big of a treatment difference there is, and so underestimating how important the differences in health actually are. So now I'm going to use an instrumental variable. I'm going to use our randomization as that instrumental variable. So I'm going to see what I can explain with R. So I'm going to do that by doing group by R, and then I'm going to take the mean of both Y and X within R, just like in the animation. And then I'm going to get the slope between those two points that I end up with, right? If I look at what I have here, I have two points with an X and a Y coordinate, and I want to get the slope between them. So this is just rise, the difference in Y's, over run, the difference in X's. I get the true effect of approximately 5. If you're not in my class, by the way, this is you'll recognize this as the walled estimator, and this is how you would use instrumental variables when your instrument is binary. It only is 0 or 1. Uh, the instrument is not binary when it takes a continuous range of values. Uh, outside of my class, you would typically use regression. In our class, we're going to use a different method. So if you're not in my class and you're looking at a continuous instrumental variable, look away because we're going to do something a little bit different. So let's use another example for my class using a continuous instrument. The analysis that we're going to be looking for here is we're going to be looking for the effect of the price of cigarettes on how many packs of cigarettes you smoke. Now, we can imagine, as economists, if the price goes up, we would expect you to smoke fewer cigarettes. But there's a problem there in that the price is determined both by the supply of cigarettes and the demand for cigarettes. So we might see that the price of cigarettes is going up because more people want cigarettes. And so that's a back door there that we don't want. So we need something that's going to affect the price of cigarettes, but otherwise have no effect on the number of cigarettes smoked. So we're going to use the cigarette tax. You, you impose a new tax on cigarettes that's going to raise the price, but realistically, there's no other way for the tax to affect the number of uh, packs of cigarettes that you smoke. So we're going to use, do this in R. We're going to load in the AER package, which has some data on cigarette packs and prices. And what we're going to do here, uh, this is basic data cleaning, but then we're going to, we're going to cut the cigarette tax. Now the tax, of course, is a continuous variable, so we're going to put it into multiple bins, as we have been doing for our other ways of using a continuous variable to explain something else. So we're going to break it into seven bins. We're going to take the mean of both price and the number of packs you smoke within each of those bins, and then we're going to look at the correlation of them. So let's look at the correlation of what is explained about price and the number of packs by our instrument. And we get a correlation of negative 0.97, a very strong effect. So it looks like the price of cigarettes has a very strong effect on the number of packs that are smoked. And in particular, we're looking at the part of the price that is driven by the tax. So an increase in the tax is going to lead to an increase in the price. is going to lead to a decline in the number of packs smoked. Let's do another brief example here. Uh, this one's from an actual research study where we're going to be interested in the effect of pollution on whether or not you commute to work by car. As you might imagine, when it's very smoggy outside, especially in a country like China, where smog can get really, really bad, you might want to drive to work so as to avoid having to breathe in all that smog as you might have to do if you were walking or walking between bus stations. And so obviously this is a problem, right? Because if more smog makes you drive more, then the driving is going to eventually lead to more smog in the future, and that's going to be bad. We want to know, does more smog actually make people drive more? So we're going to use an instrument. And in particular, we're going to use the wind in Shanghai. Now in Shanghai, a lot of the pollution is coming from the uh, east side, or from one side of the city. And so when the wind blows from a westerly direction, it blows pollution into the city, which increases the amount of pollution. But realistically, shouldn't have much of an effect otherwise on whether or not you drive your car, right? You don't drive your car by the basis of what wind direction the wind is blowing. 
There might even be some back doors here. So for example, the season that it is might affect how the wind blows and whether you drive your car, but we can control for that. It's okay that there's back doors from your instrument as long as you've controlled for them. So in this case, we see that wind affects how much smog there is. If, it's, if the wind is blowing from the west, that means that there's going to be more smog. And because there's no other way, once we've closed the season back door, to get from wind to driving, except through smog, we know that we have an instrument. And so by looking at the effect of wind on smog, and then the effect of just that part of smog we've explained with the wind, on just the part of driving we've explained with the wind, we can get the causal effect of smog on driving. That's the basics of instrumental variables. That's the concept of how we can apply it. We're looking for some variable that affects our treatment and that all paths from our instrumental variable that are open go through our treatment. That we've successfully closed and we're very sure that we've closed every single other possible backdoor between the instrument and our outcome variable except the ones that go through treatment. That gives us an instrumental variable. It works a lot like a uh, experiment, a randomized experiment, when it works well. In fact, you can envision a randomized experiment as an instrumental variable. And in fact, one of the common applications of instrumental variables is when you have an experiment that just didn't quite work perfectly. Okay, that's it. And that's it. That's all the videos that I am currently planning to do for this series. I hope that you've enjoyed them, and maybe there will be a couple more in the future. Who knows? Thank you very much for watching.